production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, a local group shares the traditions of their Scottish heritage through music and dance. Playing with a bagpipe band is maybe a little bit different than playing with other kinds of instruments because you all want to be playing exactly the same thing. As the Christian Holy Week approaches, we'll take a peek inside the beautiful St. Joseph Cathedral and Celtic music with the ladies of Longford. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome back to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. In Scotland, there are pretty much two distinct regions. There are the highlands along the northern and western boundaries of the country, and then there's everywhere else. But it's the highlands that are often portrayed as the romantic part of Scotland, with its rugged mountains and deep blue lakes. And for more than 50 years, the members of the capital city Pipes and Drums, right here in Columbus, have been dedicated to sharing the Gaelic traditions of this highland culture. Well, uh, Capital City was formed in 1963. Uh, we play traditional Scottish music and tunes not only that are traditional that have been around for sometimes hundreds of years, but even tunes that have been written uh, fairly recently. And we're still writing music for the bagpipes. It's it's not an easy instrument to play. It does take a lot of, uh, of um, breathing control uh, because you've got to blow up the bag. You've got to keep the pressure steady to maintain the tone so you don't go flat and sharp or cut out. Uh, it's got four reeds as nine notes. So uh, that's what, that's all you play is nine notes on a bagpipe. Oh, you mean, you ready? What? Uh, playing with a bagpipe band is maybe a little bit different than playing with uh, other kinds of instruments because you all want to be playing exactly the same thing. So instead of sounding like six bagpipes or ten bagpipes, you sound like one. Well, we generally uh, have trouble finding places to practice. You know, as a bagpipe band is quite loud. Uh, right now, we're quite fortunate. We, we uh, practice in the basement of uh, St. James Episcopal Church on Calumet and East North Broadway. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place to practice, but the basement is uh, all hard surfaces, low ceilings, and uh, very resonating, shall we say. Uh, it, it, it makes tuning quite a bit more difficult than it should be. And initially, what we try to do is, is uh, get the chanters all tuned to one another. Um, we've got a very good uh, class of Highland dancers, uh, and we're one of the few bands that actually has dancers with the band. Highland dancing is a traditional type of dance that, was, um, that is traditional to Scotland. Um, Highland dancing is a little more, more ballet, where Irish dancing would be more tap based. And then we also use our arms, and Irish dancers keep them straight down at their sides. You can start taking Scottish Highland dancing generally as early as four, um, and then you can dance until your body won't do it anymore. Um, our four-year-olds and any beginning students, no matter what age they are, start out with their basic Highland fling, which is the very first dance that they learn, and then potty bars and high cuts would be the next thing, which are a part of the sword dance. 
and that's what tonight we'll definitely be doing the fling and the sword. Show me you are turned out, yes. The fling was initially a recruiting dance for the army. Um, the sword dance is a dance that was done before battle or after battle. And depending on whether it was danced before battle or after battle, the story is a little bit different. So before battle, you would place your sword on the ground and dance your sword dance. And if you did not touch the sword while you were dancing, then you would be victorious. But you didn't actually know if you were going to be victorious because you don't know what the other side's dancer did, whether he touched or not. So you still had to go to battle. Um, if you danced it after, it was the dance of victory, and you would take your opponent's sword and lay it on the ground and place your sword over top of it, and then dance a, a victory dance. It's such a fun thing to learn and to be a part of this community and these bagpipers and these dancers and these teachers that it's so enriching in so many ways. So come and join us. The Capital City Pipes and Drums will be performing in Dublin's St. Patrick's Day Parade on Saturday, March 16th. The event kicks off at 11 a.m. Visit DublinOhioUSA.gov for routes and details. Our local music series continues this week with another performance by the Ladies of Longford. They joined us in the WOSU studio to perform their version of When I Was a Young Girl. This Irish-English folk ballad is off their 2009 album Unreal and concludes with a traditional Irish reel.
The Ladies of Longford will be playing live on St. Patrick's Day at Fado's Pub in Easton and in Dublin. Keep up with the band by giving them a follow on Facebook. As the Christian Holy Week approaches, we thought we'd give you this peek inside St. Joseph Cathedral in downtown Columbus. The cathedral, which was erected more than 140 years ago, is home to the Catholic Diocese of Columbus. In addition to its magnificent art and architecture, we also learned a little about how the diocese continues to play a vital role in the community. I'll be honest with you, when people walk into this cathedral, uh, the first thing they do is stare up. The first bishop of Columbus, Bishop Rosecrans, always wanted to begin building a cathedral. It took 10 years. The cathedral was completed in 1878, and uh, it was dedicated by Bishop Rosecrans who then left the ceremony, went back to his residence, and died. Now that's a rather dramatic nunc dimittis. Have you ever heard that, that term? It's, it's from uh, scripture, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Simeon, when he saw the child Jesus, said, Now, Lord, you can dismiss your servant. The building is a cathedral not because of size or a particular location. It's because this is where the bishop sits and presides over his people. Uh, over my shoulder you'll see the cathedra, or the cathedra, as some people say. Uh, it's a Greek term, means chair. The chair is occupied only by the, uh, the bishop. Uh, it's, it's the chair that gives the name to the building. And also, this cathedral is a beautiful sound chamber. The cathedral choir is, is comprised of about 17 um, professional singers from the area. It's also augmented by about a dozen volunteers. The cathedral's pipe organ um, was built by Paul Fritz, uh, who is an organ builder in Tacoma, Washington. So this is one of the, the largest pipe organs, one of the finest in the world, uh, a little over 10 years old right now. It's really a marvel of modern organ design. It is 100 ranks, which means that it's about 5,000 pipes. It's all mechanical, and so it's fascinating to go on the inside to see how it, it works. We're called to take care of the needs of the poor. And so for us, we have what's called the backdoor ministry. Last year, we fed just under 19,000 persons. We provided meals for under 19,000 persons last year. And we feed twice a day through the backdoor ministry. And it's for the poor and the needy and the homeless. It's wonderful and also kind of sad that we have to do that, that there are people who would go hungry without this. But it's wonderful that we can serve them and the cathedral becomes a vocal point not only for the worship of the diocese, but for the care of, of the poor. I'd like to say that uh, in 150 years, these walls and the pews have been kind of soaked in prayer continually. And it's a reminder of the fact that all of us are part of an ongoing community. 
stretching way back into history and will stretch forward into the future. We are the present manifestation of it, but we're part of an extraordinary continuity. Guided tours of St. Joseph Cathedral's interior, undercroft and crypt are available on weekdays and Sunday afternoons by appointment. Learn more at stjosephcathedral.org. William Souter is a renowned writer whose biography of John James Audubon was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize. That same book also received a 2005 Ohioana Book Award. His other books include a biography of environmentalist Rachel Carson and The Plague of Frogs, which explored the science of mutated frogs and its impact on humans. He's currently working on a biography of author John Steinbeck that is expected to be published later this year. He shared with us the challenges of documenting such weighty subjects. Here's the secret that every writer knows. Storytelling trumps everything. If you have a good story, a narrative that has a beginning and a middle and an end, and if it also has a strong protagonist, you're way ahead of the game. And so biography is a really natural structure for a storyteller. Biography is wonderful because you start with a main character and you start with a life that unfolds. So it's all about telling a good story and trying to hold the reader's attention. I came out of the University of Minnesota Journalism School in the late 1970s. Worked at a number of different newspapers and magazines. So I've written three books. Uh, the first one was called The Plague of Frogs. That was a work of journalism, and that covered the investigation into these outbreaks of deformed frogs here in Minnesota and other parts of North America. And then my second book was called Under a Wild Sky. That was a biography of John James Audubon, the bird artist. So I was very fortunate with the Audubon biography that it was uh, named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And then in 2012, I published my third book, On a Farther Shore, a biography of Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson is really kind of the godmother of the environmental movement. I am now at work on book number four, which is a biography of John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck is certainly one of the, one of the foremost American authors of the 20th century, and he wrote The Grapes of Wrath, Of Mice and Men, uh, East of Eden. He remains one of the best read American writers. So Steinbeck is very early days right now. I'm still reading and digesting all of Steinbeck and, and a lot of books about Steinbeck. The plan is to spend about two years researching John Steinbeck and about a year writing the book. But in terms of choosing who you're going to write about, I think that the most important thing is it has to be somebody that, that really you feel a connection with. That because of your life experiences, because of the other work you've done, they kind of fit into your frame of reference in a way that they're kind of recognizable to you. You feel like you know the person. Writing a biography is a huge logistical, organizational challenge. You're just, you're going to have thousands and thousands of documents that you're going to be relying on. There's a wonderful biographer named Stacy Schiff who has written about what it takes to be a biographer. Uh, she says you need a mild case of obsessive compulsive disorder and also a high tolerance for archival dust because you're going to spend a lot of time in libraries. Every subject is a little bit different. Every book is a little bit different. But in general, when you're writing biography, you need to identify what kinds of materials you can rely on to tell someone's story. In many cases, there's a paper trail that has been left behind, and that often is correspondence, letters, uh, diaries, and journals. And those, for important people, those tend to be collected in archival collections at major libraries. This extraordinary volume that we are looking at is one of four bound volumes that the Athenaeum owns of John James Audubon's The Birds of America. 
He painted all of his birds at an exact one-to-one -one ratio. They're all life-size. You know, I think I've probably looked at now maybe 15 sets of the Birds of America. They're all a little bit different. Each one is an original. When I started working on Audubon, I, of course, had seen a number of prints of Audubon's work, but I didn't really have an appreciation for the size and the complexity of the project. In addition to that, they are historically extremely important. In many cases, Audubon's record of America from the 1800s is, is one of the best visual descriptions we have of what the frontier was like and what the animals were like that lived there. You cannot look at these paintings without being moved by them. So if you look at the books that I've written and the book that I'm working on right now, there is a common thread that runs through all of them, and it, and it is this connection to the environment that we all share on Earth. What I like about Rachel Carson and John Steinbeck and John James Audubon is that they are real people, they lived real lives, and those real lives are stories. And they're stories that are important. They're an important part of American history. And when I find a subject that embodies all of those things, then that's sort of the ideal, that's the sweet spot for me. Well, that's our show. You can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org and give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're leaving you today with more local music by the Ladies of Longford. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. I work as a researcher for a large uh, research and development nonprofit here in Columbus, um, mostly for government contracts dealing with um, the environment and public health. I really started doing self-portraiture just to have um, images to put on <laughs> Facebook <laughs> for profile photos, and and they did, and then I just ran with it. I mean, people had a good reaction to them, and I started getting a little more experimental with them. And um, the iPhone was, was just a way for me to always be able to produce something, always be able to experiment, no matter where I was, no matter what I was doing. Whereas, you know, with the DSLR, you're lugging around a big kit. People are always surprised when they learn that I'm in the sciences and not in, <laughs> in the arts. I have so many ideas. I don't even know what's next. It's just whatever hits me at the moment. <laughs>